Good afternoon, everyone. And yes, thank you for uh, sticking with us and joining us for this session at the end, end of the day. Maddie is right. It does take a lot to sort of be saying at a screen all day. So, um, yeah, my name is Thea Berry. I'm a curator, film programmer. Um, and this evening, I'll be joined by my fellow consultants, Caroline Wilson, Megan Mitchell and Gabrielle Jackson, who will introduce themselves a little more uh, in detail as session goes on. Oh, here they are. Hi, guys. Um, so the production of this session was a truly collaborative process led by the brilliant Moira um, and with support and input from also Rebecca Taylor, Aaron Guthrie, Yasmin Begum and Phil Kennedy who can't join us unfortunately for this session but thank you guys so much for all your support and your work and knowledge. So uh, throughout today's session we'll be talking about the how of engaging with a young audience and the radical and practical ways um, with which to engage them. Why it must not be about ticking the boxes, but rather that engaging with young people must be meaningful and must be part of the fabric of how you approach audience development. Um, so the structure of this session will be broken down into five sections. Um, and if you have enough time at the end, we'll take a couple of questions. So please do uh, pop them in the chat. I'll do my best to keep up with them. Um, but we do have quite a lot to get through. So uh, do bear with. If I could have the presentation up, please. Lovely, thank you. And I will lead, let Caroline get started. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Caroline. Um, I lead a young collective called Under London, and I'm based in London. Um, and I worked with Rebecca Taylor from the Derby Quad um, on the following slides about um, threshold anxiety. And what it means in layman's terms is just how to make your space more welcoming. Um, so if you see on the pictures here to the left, that was a screening we did at Genesis called um, British Brown Girls, um, which was a screening that had created and starring by British Asian females. Um, and to the right, um, we had a day of workshops um, I believe last year um, and we um, so it's kind of created by young people at Genesis Cinema as well and one of our young people Anna got to interview Lashana Lynch who's the new 007 in the new Bond film she's also in Captain America so these were just ways of taking you can have all kinds of events at a venue and these were just examples of what we've done in the last year or so. Um, could I have the next slide please? Um, so me and Rebecca we just came up with some really simple steps because um, we also talked about practical steps that everyone can take so these are just some steps that um, you can just implement because um, I know cinemas are opening, some venues are opening tomorrow um, just making sure you have really clear, clear signage um, just making sure your film posters are up to date. Um, if it's boring to you, then it might be boring to the people who are coming in every day. So just making sure your comms are on point like a multiplexes is. Um, just being one step ahead of things. Um, also thinking, is there any young staff at your venue? Um, what's the diversity like in your um, the people um, working behind the tills, the ushers, everything? Um, if you have a cafe or restaurant, what is the atmosphere like? Um, is it a bit hostile, a bit like I'm scared to get a coffee? Or is it like they'll say hello to me anyway? Or, you know, so it's just like, what's the kind of vibe like? Um, Wi-Fi, is the Wi-Fi easy to access? Um, is the code visible? Um, these days, having Wi-Fi is a really good way of getting people to use your space for meetups getting people to keep coming back, buying that coffee, buying those snacks. Also, just thinking about your seating area. Um, do, do you have sockets to charge your laptops and phones? There's so many times I want to sit somewhere, but there's no socket. And so it's just those positioning things and thinking about how you can make it um, durable for people to stay there for a couple of hours. Also thinking about your loyalty card schemes or 
in what way do you reward the people who invest in your building um and how can there's so many ways you can do it now whether or not it's digitally or you know through the old school um stamp a card thing so just thinking about that also and these are also really practical steps the final steps that people take for granted but it matters to a lot of people so just thinking about what's the soundtrack like when you come in is it like cool film soundtracks um are you guys updating your spotify playlists are you using like you know the ambient um what's it like in the toilets is there cool artwork are your toilets clean or do people like have to go across the road to use the toilet um and is your toilets accessible for people who have disabilities um and also is there sanitary products available um and also due to covid um are you updating your covid stations um and if that is a barrier of why people are not entering your building like what are you doing to like comfort them and ensure them that if they come without their masks are you guys gonna help give them the protection they need um next slide please i think that's it oh that's it for me thank you Thanks, Caroline, and I um, look forward to hearing from you again in a minute. Um, so, yeah, I'll be talking about um, pricing, ticketing and cultural value, basically about money um, and how young people don't have any. Um, so I'll be talking to you about how crucial having a lower ticket price is as a first step into getting young people into your venue um, and how cost relates to how we inter interact with culture and art and as a result, developing a sense of personal and cultural value to film. So I'm going to start with this quote um, I found um, in an article written by Guardian film writer Catherine Shord. Um, Ever since the first cinemas were built, film has been the great egalitarian art form. Film's cultural function is intimately allied to price. If it wasn't cheap, its power would diminish. This is one of the things that drew me and many others to it going to the movies is for everyone. So what's key from this quote is the idea that film's cultural function is intimately allied to price. So if the cost of your cultural experience is affordable, then in theory, it's accessible. Um, however, for a young person, and I'm classing that as anyone under the age of 30, um, the ticket price has, generally speaking, not always been affordable. The prices have gone up and up, and therefore the idea that going to the cinema is something that you could do once a week is not commonplace at all, especially when you add a bus ticket, train ticket, or like tube or whatever, any sort of public transport on top of that. Um, you know, so if going to the cinema is, is not affordable, it's too expensive for you, then it will seem out of reach, may not hold much cultural value, meaning that if you can't afford it, then you feel like it's not for you. Sort of going back to that idea you know, part of threshold anxiety is that if you physically cannot afford to go somewhere, then that's the first sort of step into getting into that building. So this pandemic has shown, shown the sort of true inequalities in our society. When it comes to money, the economy, young people will be some of the worst hit by this. So one way to ensure that cinema retains cultural value for young people saying, you know, hey, this space is for you, this art form is for you, by making it affordable. So I've sort of broken it down into three sections of what your options can be. Um, and loads of venues across the UK, not just venues, but also community cinemas, uh, film festivals, um, have adopted a youth ticket price of around fiver, sort of give or take, which is brilliant. Um, but the age limit is a problem. You know, largely speaking, this offer will end once you, you know, pass the 25 year old hump but just because you're in your late 20s doesn't mean you still don't have the same financial worries as you did when you're in your early 20s. You know, the BFI 2022 strategy classes young people being aged between 16 and 30. You know, I'm 27 years old. I'm classed as a young person, maybe an old young person, but I'm still a young person. However, I can't access a youth person's ticket. 
you know, in making the cut of 25, you're excluding a third of your audience. So opening that up, I think is a really, really key step into getting more people, more young people to engage. Um, the next step is the sliding scale, you know, going towards a truly accessible and affordable ticketing scheme is through this. Um, so thank you to Megan for producing this wonderfully clear and super comprehensive guide on two ticketing scales um, of what is affordable for you. Um, and I think some of the cynicism that surrounds pay what you can is that venues and organizations predict that they'll make a loss that people will take advantage of the system and pay less than perhaps they should. And that is a possibility. However, what about focusing on the positives of what a system like this can do for a person who wants to engage with cinema, but you know, for who the price is a total barrier. Um, so I've taken this quote written by uh, Sarah Wright, who attended a screening of I, Daniel Blake, hosted by New Notions uh, Community Cinema in Belfast which one of our group members, Aaron Guthrie, is a producer. So thanks for sharing this with us, Aaron. Um, it took so much to write the article and to be public about something we are persistently shamed into being silent about. But I'm so glad I did. I'm feeling a lot less alone. Without seeing the film, I honestly don't think I would have found the strength to put it into words. Thank you as well for asking people to pay what they can afford. I wouldn't have been able to see it otherwise. Now, I think, what this quote encapsulates really well is that here's a person who is engaged in, in, you know, in film, in culture, but for whom the price really, really is an issue. Um, you know, but as a result of the sliding scale, they've been able to engage. And this is what I was saying at the beginning, that through making it affordable, it increases this notion that cinema holds cultural value for that person. Um, I think one of the good things to come out of this pandemic, out of this crisis, is that is the move online. Um, the physical barrier of having to get yourself to a venue and spending money on a bus ticket, as well as you know tickets themselves, it's been removed. Um, the internet has the ability to democratise our access to film and to discussion as well. Um, however, um, there's always a downside to things. Um, the move online is not the great equaliser that you would hope. Um, you know, I've taken a couple of stats here that 51% of households earning between 6,000 6, and 10,000 pounds, which is sort of the average that you would get on universal credit. Um, only 51% of them have access to internet. So for people that are living in poverty, um, having access to reliable internet is not a priority. Um, in a household, there may be several, several people vying for the Wi-Fi, or perhaps there's only one computer, laptop, or maybe just a tablet, or even just a smartphone. Um, so what can we do to combat this? Or how can we help relieve some of these stresses? Um, I worked on this little section with Yasmin Begum, so thank you for sharing this information with us, Yasmin. Um, it's a really wonderful project uh, that's run by Lee Film Society, who's a, uh, they're a community cinema, totally run by volunteers. And throughout the lockdown, um, they delivered a selection of their DVDs from their vast private collection to vulnerable people, people who lived alone. So they delivered, called them orange bags of sunshine, um, in sort of Sainsbury's shopping bags, eight DVDs, asking what that person likes, their, their personal taste of film. Um, you know, and it's such a wonderful way for people to remain connected to a community venue um, and to their community, and also reaffirming that connection to cinema's cultural and personal value to them, I think is really important. Um, so yeah, price is a small step in getting young people to engage with your cinema. However, the price of what you're offering says a lot about who can access it. In making the price accessible, affordable, you'll not only be expanding and developing your audience, but if my theory checks out, you'll be taking steps to ensure that cinema holds cultural value in people's lives. Hey, so thank you now. I'll leave you over to Megan. Thanks, dear.
Um, so I'm Megan Mitchell. Some of you may know me as the producer of Matchbox Cine Club, and I'm currently undertaking a PhD seeking to reveal the roles of independent cinema in the age of on-demand culture. So very timely. Um, if you don't know Matchbox, Matchbox runs festivals and film screenings across the UK. You may have heard of the world's first Keanu Reeves film festival, which we ran, KeanuCon, or our showcase of unseen and underscreened cult films, um, Weird Weekend. So Matchbox prides ourselves on our diverse and eclectic programming of cinema's outcasts, outliers and orphans, as well as accessibility. We use a pay what you can afford sliding scale ticket model, as Teal was just uh, exemplifying, and we have captions in all of our film screening and um, film content. Matchbox, and specifically my colleague Sean Welsh, also produce captions for film for our exhibition, predominantly working with festivals and indie exhibitors, and we've captioned some of This Way Up Again this year. So I'm sure we're all aware that currently cinema is going through a period of crisis for a number of reasons, but I think that we can look at this time as an opportunity as well, giving us a chance to reflect and plan for a better future and create a more sustainable cinema sector for more audiences. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, some measures of accessibility, which would hopefully move us forward towards that. And I think that we're all aware that accessibility is a favoured issue of concern for the sector. We all have ran, attended or participated in panels, workshops and forums on it, but we're still not quite there yet on acting or changing um, very much. And that's a problem for young audiences, not least young disabled audiences and young deaf audiences, but all young audiences who now probably more than ever before are actively aware and educating themselves on issues of inclusion for their peers and for others. It's important to remember that young audiences aren't a homogenous group and separate from disabled audiences, black audiences, working class audiences. Young audiences are these audiences. So if your cinema or festival is inaccessible and doing very little to change that, you're limiting your growth in terms of economic and cultural impact across a whole range of audiences, 25, under or otherwise. But there are various ways you can begin to address the accessibility within your organisation. And first and foremost, I would say that being led and listening to deaf and disabled audiences is the best way to know where these issues really lie within your venue organisation and how to address them. We also, as I said, have done a power of discussing, researching and working on this within the sector. So look to other organisations that have implemented good access provisions already. You might not be able to do it all, but you can do something. Can I have my next slide? So if the only thing you take away from this session today is do something, I hope it's at the top of your list. One action you can take, which is simple, supported and a good model for future access provision improvements is captions. And by captions, I mean descriptive subtitles for deaf audiences, sometimes referred to as SDH. I want you to think about how often you offer caption screenings. Right now, think about your social media content. Is it captioned? Do you make sure to share captured trailers? Do you even check if they're available? The only explanation I can give for the sector not offering captions, which are not only a necessity for deaf and hard of hearing audiences, but also aid audiences with neurodiversities such as autism and dyslexia, and audiences who have English as a second language, is the exhibition has created an anxiety for ourselves. We've created an anxiety around hearing audiences not accepting captions, causing a fuss, making it a problem. But as wonderful independent cinemas and festivals, who this year alone have proven we can adapt, learn and change so quickly and communicate this to our audiences in calm, reasoned and compassionate ways, I think we've shown that we can be brave. We can make choices to better cinema for everyone and that we have the ability to lead our audiences to shape a more inclusive cinema. And we can do just that with captions. All we need to do is be brave, put more caption screenings on. It's that simple. Can I have my next slide, please? Of course, there are a number of things which can seem not so simple, which are required to get you to that simple act of choosing to be more accessible with increased captions. But luckily that legwork is actually pretty straightforward. The first thing to do is ask the distributors or filmmakers for them. Sometimes that can be a confusing or frustrating conversation, perhaps if you're dealing with 
someone who doesn't understand what captions are, but persist. And even if they don't have them for a particular title, it's important to demonstrate an expectation for them. And that's why the second item is also repeating that request. Across your programming and putting pressure on distributors and filmmakers, the higher up the tree these access provisions can be considered and delivered, the better and easier it is for audiences and for us. The third and almost scary option is get captions yourself. And you have a few options to do that. You can look and see if other festivals or exhibitors have screened films with captions, reach out to them and use them um, and ask to use them, which most people are happy to do now if they've been funded to. And with the increase in caption screenings, particularly online in this past year, there's quite a wealth of them, uh, subtitle captions out there. If there's no caption files that you can find, you can reach out to the likes of Matchbox, who create them from scratch. And luckily, if you're based in Scotland and a Film Hub member, we're on retainer at the moment to assist with that, no cost to the organisation. But we're also happy to advise otherwise. And creating captions is often a lot less costly than you'd think. And funding is definitely keen on seeing access budget lines that have real impact, and captions can provide that. The fourth and final thing is share them, and this is a key one. Once you have captions, share them. Share them with filmmakers, distributors, and other exhibitors. Get them out there. On screen, you can see a little um, screenshot from Matchbox's website with their ever-updating spreadsheet of films. Currently, it only lists what we've done in 2020, which is at 330 titles at the moment, but we're updating it daily. Next slide, please. So screening with captions regularly is an un uncharted territory. Matchbox has been screening films with captions to real live audiences for two years now, with not <coughs> one complaint. And I think this is because we're very clear with audiences that we do this so that everyone can come along and enjoy our events. And we've seen a growth in exhibitors, especially in mid-tier or mid-sized festivals in Scotland, consciously and seriously increasing their caption provisions, including Glasgow Short Film Festival, Take One Action and Inverness Film Festival, both in their physical and online editions. And like I say, online, we've seen a massive growth in the last six months, with more and more exhibitors taking up the mantle and ensuring captions on their online content. All of which means is that there is a wealth of insight and guidance across the hubs, inclusive cinema and bigger picture websites to draw on. And again, I can't stress enough how useful just speaking to others who have already taken the leap can be. Film Hub Scotland has been a vital part in supporting these activities. So I would speak to your hub about support, both funding and advice wise. If we can take the choice to open our venues in a pandemic, communicating fundamental changes to how we have to operate on a near weekly and now near daily basis, I think we can get more captions on screen, which is just the start of a more accessible cinema sector. Next slide, please. And that, just to round off my section, I just want to pull the thread of programming a little. I would say, of course I would say, the Matchbox is a good example of brave programming. We program everything from West Berlin trans punk musicals of the 80s, the lost Bill Murray films, the experimental Japanese artist shorts of the 60s, plus of course a power of Nicolas Cage films. We program eclectically, sincerely and bravely because we believe in our programming. These films to us are exciting, they should be seen, enjoyed, shared, cried, laughed to. And I know cinema faces uncertainty, but with the release schedules in flux and cinema seeking audiences to return and really being inspired by the power of film, that shared experience, it's now is the time to find joyful, urgent and wonderful programming. Could I have my final slide, please? And to bring this joyful, wonderful, eclectic programming into cinemas, I think collaboration is vital in the current climate and just in general for the future of cinema. Diversifying the voices of programming means more diverse audiences. And Matchbox has seen just that. On left, this slide is just some examples of independent exhibitors, programmers and film clubs we've previously worked with who bring fresh ideas and fresh audiences and who are delivering some incredible events and programming that I think cinemas could only dream of. And I'm not saying ignore the fear of letting others program into your cinemas. I'm advocating for embracing it. This year, we've passed a lot of thresholds of our own anxieties, some of which we would have never imagined. And I think now is the time for us to continue to be 
being brave and for the betterment of cinema and for the betterment of our audiences. Thank you. Oh, there we go. I think I lost all of you, but I think I'm back. Um, I just quickly, before we go on to um, Gabby, I want to pick up something that I'm seeing in the comments. Going back to the programme that um, Lee Film Society were doing, so that's the, we have someone in the comments, Paul, who is part of Lee Film Society, um, basically bring up the option, you know, that digital poverty doesn't just sort of limit itself to the internet, of course, but also DVD players and how so many people didn't have access to that. Um, so they had people donate things and they had 12 DVD players, PS3 donated, uh, 1500 DVDs donated, um, Studio Canal donated DVDs, and they made 200 deliveries to their community. So yeah, I just wanted to add that in. So in case not everybody is watching the comments, I just thought that was a really great detail. Okay, so over to you, Gabby. Hi everyone, I'm Gabrielle, the marketing and programme assistant at the Brewery Arts Centre in Kendall. We're a mixed arts venue and I run the Young Programmers Group, which we call the Brewery Film Ambassadors. They're a group of young people between the ages of 18 and 30, and they're currently working on their first mini film festival, which will be centred around the works of female directors. I'm going to be chatting a bit about the value of youth voice and the things that I've learned so far working with our young programmers group and hopefully there'll be some practical things that are applicable to your organization's creative groups. So we started recruiting the group using Indeed, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and our website and we received applications from a real variety of people from college students to secondary school teachers and we found that recruiting via several online platforms worked really well for us. We started the group really small with about six members at first and with a narrower age bracket of 18 to 24. The initial idea was that the group would program one film a month but after getting to know the group and visiting Storyhouse in Chester to learn about their wonderful young programmers group and see them in action I realised that we could really improve our structure. So what has been working well for us so far is broadening the age range to 18 to 30 and also increasing the number of members to around 10 because it really has provided us with a lot more variety of opinions and it means that when people can't make a meeting it can still be really productive. Despite the age range the group has gelled really well. Having a shared goal has been really important for us as well. So rather than programming just one screening at a time per month I found that planning this larger event has really, with multiple titles, has really allowed the group to work better as a team and get their teeth into the project. Creating a larger event has also meant that everyone knows what they're working towards and when, instead of it being a continuous project. This has helped people know how much of a time commitment it's going to be. I feel like eventizing has been spoken about generally quite a lot, but I've found that having an extra element to a screening, be it a panel discussion or a director Q&A, can really add value to the experience, it can increase sales, and also it's more enjoyable to organise. The group communicates outside of meetings using Discord, which is a platform originally intended for gamers. And it's been great because you can create different chats for different purposes and you can have spaces that are just especially for announcements. There's also an option for voice and video calls. So there are no lost Zoom links and the members don't have to share any personal information with each other to communicate. Cinema trips and online film nights have also been a really great way for people to get to know each other. And I think having that social element has been really important. I know that I'm not alone in struggling to maintain momentum in a project during the pandemic. However, when normality does return, there are a few things that we're gonna keep from lockdown, which include video calls on Discord in between face-to-face -face meetings and also the online movie sessions. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So the young programmers groups really help challenge the perceptions of what young people want. From the first meeting, the group were really vocal about what they want to see, how much they want to pay, and how we should be encouraging young people through our doors. They demonstrate that like any demographic, young people aren't a homogenous group, and they offer a range of insights and contrasting preferences. On this slide, you can see some of the films that the group were most excited to watch at the cinema, and also some of their all-time favorites, including The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Downton Abbey. Something that also might be surprising is that the group don't particularly like social media, and that's why we use Discord to communicate. 
Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. As the group are volunteers and they provide us with so much, it's been really important that we take time to consider what they're receiving in return for all of their work and to make sure that it's a symbiotic relationship. We created discount cards for the members. Um, they offered a 10% discount on cinema tickets and also uh, the food at our restaurant. They also receive free ticket when they sign up like join the group. And after any face-to-face -face meetings, there's a free cinema trip for the group. And also we have free cinema socials in between face-to-face -face meetings. In terms of experience, it's been helpful to consider, is this fun? Is this boosting the member's CV? And what are they learning? We also really wanted the young programmers to have access to the knowledge of our team and to be integrated within the organisation. So I'm from the marketing department and they get help with marketing from there. And also any notes that I have for meetings always get fed back to our team. The group also can ask our programme manager, Chris, any questions. For example, when he did a Q&A talk with Kendall College film students, the film ambassadors were all invited to attend and ask questions too. And Chris also does a weekly Facebook live stream um, every week on Thursdays at 1 p.m. It's called Big Screen to Live Stream, and he talks about all of our weekly program. I can see the members watching the live stream, and also I can see them commenting questions to Chris as well. And finally, it's been important not just to ask for the group suggestion, but to facilitate them and to action change so that we really do reach the new audiences that we're so desperate to reach and we create an, an enjoyable experience for the young programmers where the ideas are actualized. Thanks. Great, thanks, Gabrielle. Um, so to bring uh, just attention to just one question quickly was if uh, what online platforms did you recruit from? We used Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Indeed, and our website. Great, thank you. I hope those are, that clears things up for people in the comments discussing that. Um, okay, Caroline, over to you again. Um, hi, everybody. Um, kind of following off from Gabrielle's point, um, I'm going to be extending it um, to young film collectives and venue takeovers. Um, so I've run my own film collective for the last four years. Um, so Pictured is just two examples of takeovers we did. One was at the Sony Pictures um, um, so that young people could get excited about it because it was coming out the same week as like, I think a Marvel film. So it was a bit like, it was a bit like coming against the big boys. So we just wanted to kind of like have a give back to people. And to the right, um, that was a screening at Catford Muse when it opened. We showed Last Black Man in San Francisco for um, a five pound um, special ticket rate for young people. Um, and we also did a meet up afterwards where people could like talk about the film and just meet somebody new at the new venue. Um, and Catford Muse was a venue that a lot of the young people didn't even knew existed after it reopened and rebranded um next slide please um so this looks a bit mad um that's the way my mind works sometimes um <laughs> sorry um so basically um with film collectives um sometimes it's very common that groups have multiple ideas happening at once or kind of have to think a couple of ste steps ahead because it takes sometimes it takes like a couple of months to get a project together um so one idea we had um on the top left you cannot read this at all because it's um it's condensed but um we wanted to do like a christmas care care bag gift bag um giveaway um so this saturday we're doing it we've teamed up with genesis cinema um and mora put us in contact with another of our film group called Massive Cinema. So we're going to give away 25 um, gift bags um, for young people for free. So as the cinema reopens this weekend, um, they can get some stationery, some film merchandise, and just check in. Because sometimes what I figured out is that 
from my experience, it's not just the film, it's having a conversation and just getting out of your house and meeting someone new. Um, sometimes that, like all the other stuff is great. And obviously you're there for film, but sometimes it's really a personal thing of just, um, cause you don't know what people are going through basically. And that could have really helped somebody. And um, so, yeah. Next slide, please. Um, so there's so there's been over the last four four years. This is just London. Um, I'm sure my other colleagues on this call can talk about their own um, areas. There's been a like a really big rise in collectives such as Bounce, Forever Young Film Club, Massive, We Are Parable, Laville, Tape Collective. So there's a lot of people who all have their own niches, all have their own um, specific um um tailored film film choices and objectives of what they're trying to do in the in the whole film exhibition sector and this is really, um with the other venues and this is great but i think we also need to start thinking about what's next um because these people are established like they've got their relationships i think we now need to start taking interest in who's next, who's the next 16 year old who's got an idea. And we need to also start investing in them. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so um, just being open to your inbox for who might come in contact with you, a preconception might be that young people are disorganized, that you know they're flaky, um, but they're not, chances are if they've taken the time to send you an email, it's something that they've thought about. Um, they've probably been to your venue as well. So sometimes it's about like dedicating a time in your week in your job role or as a venue, really checking in with those emails and following up with them and building those relationships. And sometimes it's about choosing your hard. Yeah, it's hard to like check your inbox and like schedule in Zooms or, you know check in with these young people and these collectives but it's also hard when you can you look back in your year and you're like oh we haven't really done anything or you know like we haven't really grown in terms of our engagement that's even harder and sometimes that's a harder pill to swallow so it's about choosing your heart and putting the work in daily to ensure that hey we have solidified our relationships um so in fact a film audience our young consultants group. Um, normally we've kind of done newsletters, but maybe in the following year, we can also um, bring it to life more and just grow and um, maybe use social media or online platform a bit more to showcase our ideas and the other young people we've been working with. Next slide, please. And that was an idea from, and um, there's in Aaron in our group, he's a film consultant Aaron Guthrie and he really like is behind this idea as well and he's a, someone who does this full time now so he's a really good person to get in touch with as well um, and this is just a range of resources I found useful um, Cinema for All are a really good organisation so maybe you've got a young collective who gets in touch with you you can forward them that email so they can also get mentorship so when they're working with your venue they can lend the collective equipment, give them funding. Um, also, Foundation for Future London, if you're in a, in an East London borough, um, Newham, Waltham Forest, Hackney, Tower Hamlets, they offer funding as well and support. Um, and the two lovely ladies below is Naomi, who's um, we screened some of her work. Um, that was a film called Future First, which celebrates like young black women. And to the left, um, that's Olivia, um, who um, started her own production company, has been working on it for over two years, and we've been able to see the fruits of her labor also. So it's about really building those relationships and you know doing the hard work and just checking in with people and supporting them um, and really getting out of your comfort zone. Um, I think that's it from me. Okay, great. Super interesting. And I'm sure, I really hope that for those watching, 
some really uh, good like practical bits of advice. Um, I'm just going to dig into the the chat. There are a few comments, I may, and if anybody has any further questions, please you pop them in there. Um, one of the comments I'm just looking at is um, there are still people who are 23 older who are earning over 100k. I saw using such schemes, sort of talking about t young persons ticket pricing. Um, yeah, I'm sure that is definitely true that there are 23 year olds who are earning 100k. I, I don't know where they are um, because most people um, who are in their 20s are not earning that amount of money, especially if you're under the age of 25. Um, of course, there are going to be people like that sort of sitting around, but most people aren't. And you have to think about the larger audience of young people who are worse off than the previous generation. Um, I would also say as well that that type of, um, again, self-created anxiety that exists within the exhibition sector, like um, around captions, it also exists around sliding scale ticket models, despite the fact that not only organisations like Matchbox, but a number of other festivals, particularly again um, in Glasgow, have been using sliding scale and evidence that not only does it increase inclusion, it also increases box office income. Like, you make more money if more people can attend and if more people are engaging. And I think that it's really important to say that when you're using that sliding scale model, it's not a pay what you want or pay what you fancy, it's a pay what you can afford and that using the, um, the green bottle uh, sliding scale that sets out the three different increments of, you know, if you can afford to go on holiday, if you can afford to buy books that are uh, brand new if you're buying them second hand that's a really nice indicator for audiences to genuinely think about what they can afford and if they're continuing to engage in your um, activity they're going to be honest about that I think that um, these imagined uh, 23 year olds that are just minted are just another excuse for the sector not to move forward with access. Yeah I think you're quite right really quite right there and I think Another thing, touch on what um, Gabrielle and Caroline, what you, Caroline, what you were both saying about getting young people into program is that, you know, how are we going to get young people in? It's by working with them. I think it's a really key first step by saying, you know, if they're part of this venue, then they will attend. Also, it's a really wonderful way to diversify your programming. Um, because they will think of, you know, if you bring in other groups, they will think of things that you perhaps would never think of. Yeah, I agree. I think as well, asking pe young people what they actually want is just the best way to find out. And once they start coming more regularly, then they bring their friends and sometimes their friends want to join as well. And it's just, it all starts from there and that's what's important. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm a little conscious of time, so I will wrap up now. Um, but thanks, guys. That was really fun. Um, and I hope that people watching, you got a lot from that session. Again, um, if you want to continue the conversation, please do get um, in contact with Maureen McVean. And if there's anybody that any of us you want to talk to, anybody else, I'm sure she can put you in touch with us. So I hope you enjoy your evening um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Like, take care, everyone. <laughs>